The gospel this morning comes from John chapter 6, verses 1 through 21. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that was doing for uh, they saw the, the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went to the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what, was going to, what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here with, who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled 12 baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized what they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. He got into a boat and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat and they were terrified. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward where they were going. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks. be to God. You may remember the story of the little boy who came out of Sunday school class all excited, looking for his mom or his dad. He had a story to tell. They had just learned in Sunday school class about the crossing of the Red Sea. And so when he found his dad, he says, Dad, Dad, you will not believe what we learned in Sunday school today. He says, well, what was it, son? He says, Moses took the Israelites out of Egypt and Pharaoh's army was chasing after them. And they came up to the Red Sea. And at that point, Moses pulled out his walkie-talkie and called out the uh, Israeli Air Force to come in to do a bombing raid on top of the Pharaoh's army while the Navy created a pontoon uh, bridge so that they could cross over to the other side. Dad said, now, son... Is that what they taught you in Sunday school today? Well, not exactly, Dad, but if I told you what they told me, you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> These miracle stories that we enter into where we talk about the healing hands of Jesus feeds the world. It can be to our modern mind stories that sometimes it's hard to engage with. Sometimes it's like, what really happened on that day? Is there a way to demystify these miracles into a way in which we can understand them at our own level? Well, I'm not here today to, to demystify those miracles. I think those were signs of God working in our midst to reveal to us the very nature of God. Yet at the same time, there were opportunities for us to grow and to learn more about who we are in relationship with God. Did you hear that today? 
that Jesus asked a question that was a test? Jesus knew how the story was going to end. And quite frankly, that is true for each and every one of us with our relationship with God. God already knows the end of our story, the end of our path, the, the way in which we're headed. We, unlike God, do not. And in our walk with God, and sometimes in our walk without God. We try to make our own way. We try to figure it out on our own. And what we find out today is that sometimes when we're given the opportunity to give advice or to give insight or to be helpful, we don't always get it right. Reminder again, Jesus asked a question that was a test. Where are we going to buy food for all these people? That was the test question. We know the answer that first came up. says, says Lord, you know, six months wages wouldn't be able to, to buy enough food to feed all these people. Anybody want to raise their hand to see if that was the correct answer to the question that, that Jesus asked? Immediately, our minds went to solving the problem without God. Our immediate solution was, what would it take me to be able to do what Jesus just asked? Well, if I was required to feed all these people, it would take me at least six months of working hard and saving every penny of it so that I might be able to purchase the amount of food necessary to feed all these people. I thought it was quite interesting that one of Jesus' disciples, when offered that question, didn't say to Jesus, you know, man doesn't live by bread alone, Jesus, but by the words that come from God Almighty out of his mouth, right? I mean, he, he could have taken a high religious tone with Jesus, saying that this might be a really good day to fast, Jesus. I mean, didn't you fast 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness? and that you were able to conquer Satan and all of his temptations? Couldn't we just fast one day? No. Isn't it interesting sometimes when you and I are presented with a issue or a problem in our life, we go to an earthly solution first? A solution that may or may not require God's help at all. Jesus is testing his disciples. Now, there is a meek solution to this problem. Andrew offers up, well, you know what? There is a little boy here with two fish and I barley loaves, but but even what are they among so many? Even there, you and I are usually confronted with this idea of scarcity. We actually do not have enough to solve the problems that surround us. Oh, we have some, we have little, we have meager resources, but not enough to really make an impact into the world in which the solutions are needed. Again, that is thinking with our own mind about what we can do on our own. 
sometimes when we come to church today, we are needed to be reminded that we're not on this walk alone on this world in which we live this life. Jesus was sent here to remind us that this is a pilgrimage with God if we want. This is an opportunity to to live life with God and God's help. This past week, I was able to read through the the cards that were filled out last Sunday on all those that had felt God working in their life, how they had felt God heal their life, how they had felt God intervene at a time in their life. It was a wonderful reminder for me as I was reading through how desperately we all need that touch of God in our life to to heal and to help, to restore, and to encourage us to live life together. Some of you may, from your American history, remember 1610 in Jamestown, that winter that they went from 500 people down to 60. Now, some of of the deaths were due to illness and some of the conflict with the Native American tribe that lived around them. But the majority of the people died from starvation. And what is so interesting about Jamestown and people starving is is that they were surrounded by plenty. There was plenty of fish in their area. There was plenty of game fowl in their area, quail. There was plenty of deer in their area. But because most of the people who came were from the city, they were ill-equipped to live off of what the land produced. That can be almost a metaphor for you and for me. Many of us can be dying of starvation with our life with Christ. Many of us could be living in this world thinking that we do not have enough to be able to get through this life in which we're living. If only we had more resources available to us, we could get through the trials of which we're going through. If we only had a bounty and not the scarcity in which we're experiencing. But we are surrounded each and every day by sufficient grace. God surrounds us each and every day with the amount that we need if we would but involve our life with him. If we would but entrust what we think is meager, like Andrew. All I have here is this little boy's two fish and five loaves, Jesus. But it was an offering to him. There may have even been on Andrew's part an expectation to see what Jesus would do with such meager resources. Andrew may have already experienced in Christ through all the healing ministries that he had seen that he was willing to trust such a simplistic and under-resourced answer to Jesus' question. And what we find out, because Jesus knew how this story was going to end, we see the bounty that comes from offering such meager supplies to Christ. We find out that not only 5,000 were fed that day, but 12 baskets of leftover surplus was gathered after everybody had eaten their fill. 
This is to remind you and me that no matter where we are in our walk, no matter what is going on in our lives, that we can offer whatever meager resources we think we have to Christ, and it will be enough. And that God will work in and with and through us and around us to bring us to where we need to be. And quite frankly, we have testimony after testimony of people in this room and in all of the services in which we attend that can testify that when they have offered the meagerness of their life to Christ, they have found the bounty of His grace that has healed, that has restored, that has renewed their life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.